everyone, and uh, good morning for our colleagues uh, in uh, across the Canada. This is an excellent day. Uh, good. My name is uh, Miguel Lablon, the Executive Director of the New Brunswick Association of Social Workers, and I have the privilege of welcoming you all uh, to this first series of three webinars organized by the Mural McQueen Ferguson Center for Family Violence in conjunction and partnership with the Canadian Association of Social Workers, the New Brunswick Association of Social Workers, and the School of Social Work at St. Thomas University. The intent of this webinar is to provide social workers with an understanding of the dynamics of violence in the lives of women, what it is, why it occurs, and how to respond and its impact in the lives of individuals and communities. It is one way for the CSW and the NBSW to celebrate the profession while providing opportunity to support and strengthen social work practice. Today, we are extremely fortunate to present an amazing guest speaker to this webinar. Rena Arsenault is a registered social worker with the province of New Brunswick. Uh, and in 2014, uh, our great Rena was appointed to the Order of Canada. Ms. Arsenault has been the Associate Director of the Merrill McQueen Ferguson Center for Family Violence in 1993. She is recognized as an activist and educator to end family violence. So before I invite our esteemed uh, guest speaker, I would like to welcome you to our moderator for today, Martin Paquette. Thank you. Hi, thank you, uh, Miguel. Uh, so hello, my name is Martin Paquette, and I'm the social work consultant uh, with the New Brunswick Association of Social Workers. Um, as a matter of housekeeping, uh, I would like the participant to know uh, that the format of this webcast will be a four-minute uh, presentation by, by Rena, and followed by a two-minute uh, question period. Uh, this question and answer period uh, will be moderated uh, by Jenny Thornhill and myself. Uh, for our national audience uh, joining us today online, uh, during the presentation, uh, you can type in and send your question at any time, and we will begin to ask questions uh, from our live online audience at the end of the presentation. So now, without further wait, it's my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome Rena Arsenault. Rena? Okay, I'm going to ask for the people online. Can you hear me? Can you hear me well? Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, so much for coming here. This is new. This is exciting. It's a new way of presenting from across Canada while being here in the east in New Brunswick. We all made it before the storm. I know that some of you across Canada won't have the storm that's about to hit us this afternoon, but at least we're all able to be here. And it's really an extreme pleasure to be able to do this. Now, 40 minutes, for the one that know me, is not a lot. I can probably talk about this issue for a couple of days. But I will try to keep to my notes in order to be able to do justice to some of the issues that I'd like to be able to talk about today. One other thing I want to do before I start, though, is I want to thank some people for the presentation that I'm going to be doing. The first people that I'd like to, to really thank is the women that I have known. The women that I have known that have survived uh, intimate partner violence in their relationships. The ones that have shared their stories with me the ones that have trusted me enough to be able to share that and really increase my knowledge about the complexities of what they lived. The second that I'd like to also thank is two people, uh, Art Fisher and Nancy McDonald. They are from the Nova Scotia Trauma Informed Network. And the, some of the, the, uh, the trauma informed lens that I will allude to not really much in formula on, but allude to, will uh, comes from their knowledge, and I'd like to thank them for that. Whoops. Now, the learning objectives will be uh, the ones that we have now on the screen. Will be to recognize and understand the complexity of the issue will be also to enhance a trauma, uh, to enhance a trauma-informed practice skills for responding to IPV. And last but not least, to ensure that we as professionals are accountable for the role we play intervening in situation of IPV. 
Um, the one definition that I always use is the one that we have here for the province of New Brunswick. So I will read it out loud as it is written right now. And I then will have, like to have just a, a few minutes to tell you why I chose to talk about IPD and not violence against women. Because I think that, that some people have difficulties understanding different terms or, or coming to term, I guess, with a different term that we may use. So the province of New Brunswick defined the uh, IPB is when a person who is currently or previously in an intimate personal relationship uses abusive, threatening, harassing, or violent behavior as a means to psychologically, physically, sexually, or financially coerce, dominate, control another member of that relationship. As you see, it's very wide. Individual who were previously who are currently involved in intimate partner or romantic relationship with each other, regardless of whether this relationship was between same-sex couple or different sex couples, or whether the couple cohabitated or didn't. So you see how wide it is. And why I, I kind of like the term intimate partner violence, it is certainly not to hide how the issue is, be, is, is being lived out there. It's really to uh, always remember that we need to talk about the differences also. So that same-sex couple can be included in our definition. That different genders can be included. So it's a bit more inclusive. And that is the reason why I chose intimate partner violence as doing training on this issue. The types of violence... <clears throat> The types of violence, I'm sorry, the clicker doesn't work, so I'm not able to click, so I thank Maxine for helping me out here. So the types of violence that we usually talk about, and for the first place, I know that uh, most of you have heard a lot of these, uh, these terms before, I've heard a lot of those definitions, have talked about a lot of these complexity, but just to ensure that we are all on the same page, I will take five minutes to repeat that knowledge. Because every time I don't, I always miss someone. So if for all of us, just to kind of again, to review how we see the issues, I think it's a lot easier for them all coming at the table with that same information in our mind. So the types are certainly emotional, psychological violence, the physical, sexual, spiritual violence, financial exploitation, neglect, injury to pets, destruction of property, criminal harassment, which includes stalking, and the last of the continuum, homicide. Now taking a few seconds to just kind of define each of them, you will see that I begin to define it by quotes from women. Who best to define the issues as from people that have lived it? So this one woman really defined the emotional, psychological violence that she went through as I always felt like I was walking on it. Always afraid of when the other shoe would fall. Afraid of saying, doing, looking the wrong way in fear of upsetting him. It was unbearable. The whole relationship was abusive. He just never put his hands on me. So that was his her way of defining what she was living. So certainly, when we talk about psychological, emotional, we include the verbal. We include the way that this violence takes away, tears at the self-esteem and self-confidence of the person. And that's the team that we cannot forget, because that is the recurrent issues that we see when we have clients that have lived intimate partner violence. That, that tear in their self-confidence, that tear in that self-esteem, that self-image that they do not have anymore. One of the ones that, and I'm very sorry, I just noticed this morning that I had forgot one slide, and it's on financial abuse or violence. And certainly we cannot forget financial violence because it is also a big reason why people stay in relationships that are abusive. Exertion of power and control of someone over your finance, 
is really difficult to get you to be able to understand or be of the, the means to leave. And it's certainly somebody that controls your paycheck, controls what you do with your money. And I heard a new one the other day, and I've been uh, uh, at this stuff for 34 years now. And I had not heard this one, but it was this woman telling me that he knew exactly where she was at all times because he used to follow her debit card. And so every time she would buy something, the phone would ring, her cell phone would ring, and he would then tell her how dare she spend that much of money and what did she buy at Walmart or wherever she had been. So another way of also controlling what you're doing with your money. Another term is there's certainly physical violence. Now that one doesn't need a lot of, of uh, definition because we all understand it. It's something that's visible. It's easier to see. One woman talked about it this way. At first, when we had a disagreement, he used to scream at me to the top of his, of his lung. He, even, he would even go as far as shaking me like a, a doll until I said the same as him. One day, he arrived home from work in a bad mood, and he pushed me out of the way so hard that I fell. He then kicked me in the ribs for a few minutes. I could not even breathe. So certainly, physical violence does leave its mark. It certainly does leave physical but emotional marks also on a person. And it is one of the violence that's punishable by law. Sexual violence. Sexual violence is certainly something that a lot of women living in an intimate relationship experience, though we don't talk about it an awful lot. And that's why the second uh, webinar will really talk about this issue a lot more. So I'm just going to give you what one of the women talked about. And she said, I belong to my husband. It always said, he always said, you are married to me now, so I own you. Sometimes he would insist for me to do things that I did not want, really want to do. But I had no choice in the matter. For many, the bedroom is a very difficult place to be. And so we must remember this. And that's something that's very easy to talk about. Especially not if we looked at our, our past. I mean, in my word, generation. It's only been in 1983 that Bill C-127 was changed. And that we can, uh, as married women, we could actually charge our husband for rape. And so it's only been not even a generation. So we need to understand that. But I won't say any more on that one because we will talk about it a lot more in depth at the second webinar. Another type of violence is certainly spiritual violence. And this woman explained it like this. When my husband became a born-again Christian, it didn't make him a better person. He just wanted to have God on his side whenever he needed an excuse to control and abuse me. And we need to understand the spiritual violence is very much part of this. So spirituality can in include religion, but spirituality can include other, where you take your strength from. May it be meditation. May it be wherever you feel that you're gaining your strength. And if there's the one place that you cannot get that strength, then it becomes very hard to keep living what you're living on a daily basis. Criminal harassment. This one woman said, his affair, his lack of respect for me and the kids became intolerable. So I left. But then he began to stalk me. He would text me every five minutes. He would leave me message at my work constantly. It was hell. Mm, technology is a beautiful thing. I'm the first one to say, I do love my Facebook. You know, I'm the 13 of 14 at home. I have a clue of nieces and nephews and great nieces and great nephews. And the only way to connect with my family is through Facebook, through texting, messaging. It's unbelievable. But anything also has another side to it. And technology can also make life hell for a lot of people that live into an abusive relationship. I remember this one woman telling me how she had two young children, so couldn't turn off her cell phone. So I added on, on buzz, so it would, it would buzz. And, um, but she would go to meetings, she would go to boardroom, and it vibrates constantly. And she knew that it was him. 
but couldn't answer because she was at work. But the difficulty of living that with her colleague looking at her, trying to keep that face, that professional face, while knowing that she'll have hell to pay when she gets home. So that kind of reality is also something that we, now with new technologies, that is very much lived, especially by younger, the younger generation and me. Certainly also threats and attempts to kill. An abusive partner means still fear by threatening to use a weapon on a, uh, on a, on a victim, and one that, particularly that I know in New Brunswick, uh, in our rural community, unfortunately, there's still a lot of guns under the bedroom, the, the, the bed. And I don't know about you, but I'd feel kind of threatened if there was a gun under my bed every night I went to bed. I don't care if the bullets are locked somewhere. There's a gun under my bed. And that certainly used an amount of threat just by being there. Threatening to take the children away. Threatening to, to harm or kill the victims or the victim's children. Threatening to harm or kill another family member. Threatening to put her or him in an institution. Now, remember that a lot of our women are vulnerable when women are living with disabilities or women that are living with mental health issues. So we can't forget the vulnerabilities of particular, particular women. Threatening to tell her or his friend, men, and family, or employer some lies. Threatening to commit suicide. And this one is very common around our youth, especially teens. That is something that we hear a lot. Uh, threatening to withdraw immigration sponsorship. You know, how difficult would that be? Especially if you don't understand what Canada is all about. If you're a newcomer, if you're just arriving. Threatening to harm the pets. And threatening to destroy or actually damage. Very possession. I don't know about you. I've got many things that I got from my mother or from my dad. And now that they're dead, I've got those, those possession that I really, really are dear to my heart. And it would kill me to have them destroyed. But many, that is the first thing that gets destroyed. And one woman designed it, just described it this way. I was seven months pregnant when he shot my cat in the basement. And as cleaning the blood on the walls, I knew he was telling me that I was next. And it's certainly something that happens. Pets are at harm, and when the pets get hurt, there is more danger. There is more danger in the house. So what are we talking about? Violence is an abuse of power. And, you know, a lot of people have really believe that violence is about a loss of power, a loss of control, and it's not. It really isn't. It really is about using your power Constantly, it's constant. And it's also frequent. And it's also intense. And it is done to control. It is done to keep the other person in the position of inferiority. And it is done to improve certain behaviors that they see as wrong. So you need to understand that it, it is much more than we need to understand the undercurrent of the violence and why it's being used. So it is about power and control. And it is about using just the amount of power and control that you need in order to get the results that you want. Who are the victims? Well, depending on the definition, and I'm not going to go there today, because if we start talking about methodology, maybe we'll be here until the storm is over. But certainly, some of the studies that have been done saying that 87% are women, and 17% are men. And in the 17% that are men, you need to remember some of the same-sex relationships. And some of them are also father-son relationships. So we need to understand that, too. A little bit more about who are the victims. Korea did a really good study of the last stat can studies that they had done, and looking at really their data, and they came to see that women who reported intimate partner violence were three times more likely than men to be sexually assaulted, 
beaten, choked, or threatened with a knife or a gun. More than twice as likely to be physically injured. Six times more likely to receive medical attention. Five times more likely to be hospitalized. Three times more likely to take off paid or unpaid time off from work because of the consequence of violence. Three times more likely to be killed by their intimate partner. And 41 times, 41 percent of women who killed their spouse were acting in defense themselves against a violent partner. What are some of the risk uh, factors for the perpetrator? Now, a lot of times, and I'm just going to touch on that, because it's important that we also keep that lens in mind. I mean, well, who, what makes him tick kind of deal. So really, some, a lot of them come from our child survivors of abuse, uh, or they have witnesses. They certainly believe in traditional gender roles. You know, they're very, they're very inflexible on the way things are done. They are rigid. They're also very impulsive, especially in relationships. Quick, quick relationship. Quick to say I love you. Quick in getting intimate in relationships. Very got a big tendency of blaming others. Blaming others for a lot of things that happen to them and socially isolated. So underlining reasons are certainly they're emotionally dependent. And, and that's a very interesting thing that we need to talk about more. But for today, I'll leave it at that. They really have low self-esteem. And we need to understand also they need to feel safe and in control. So talking about some of their childhood stories may make them a little bit more controlling of themselves, but of others around them. In order to understand, we need to explore. We need to explore the power and control. How does power and control are used in an IPV relationship? You know, we keep asking, well, what's, that, what's that about? Why she stay? You know, that question. We never ask, why does he use violence? But we do ask a lot, why does she stay? Well, I'll, we'll look at the power and control very quickly, but just so that we know, we have an understanding. What does that look like? And I've got to tell you, the emotional, psychological, and verbal violence is very subtle. You know, it's not something in your face. And we could very well, you know, somebody could be an audience and go through emotional violence that we wouldn't see it. Because remember, they know each other. And, you know, uh, sometimes a set of eyes can say a lot. You don't need to go any farther. You know your place. So you need to remember that. So certainly coercion and threats are used. Certainly intimidation. Emotional abuse. Isolation. Minimizing Denying, blaming, minimizing what's happening. A lot of women will call about crazy making. And I say, it feels crazy. I, I don't know. I, I think I saw it happening, but I don't know anymore. Because of the way that it's being retold to her of how that episode just happened. Certainly using children. And I remember I worked 11 years in a shelter. And one of the things that we saw a lot was how the children were used in, in an intimate partner violence, how they became part of the entire relationship. We talked about economics, but not to forget, certainly male privileges. You know, even in 2015, male privileges are still out there. And if we look at our rural communities, it's even more ingrained. So we need to remember that. If you want to know more about the power and control wheel, I would really advise you to go on YouTube and just Google Ellen Pence. And you will see her talking. She is one of the co-authors uh, co of the power and control wheel. And she does a very good job of explaining how that came together. So I would advise you to go and, and really look at that YouTube. We need to also talk about the violence in a continuum. You know, 
some people, and I know that the, the cycle of violence talks about that, about that honeymoon phase. And we have a tendency of thinking that during the honeymoon phase, there's no violence. It's so untrue. The relationship is always violent. The honeymoon phase, what it does is ensure that she stays. So using just enough. So it will be nice, beautiful flowers, yes. But we didn't think, I bought you those flowers. So that you always understand, there's always an undercurrent. There's always an undercurrent to the relationship happening. So the continuum, it's always in a continuum. And it's part of the people's lives. It's not a one-time event. That is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about an ongoing. And we're certainly talking about a person that has not lost control, but wants to gain control. And it certainly, it increased with time. And so next is just to just quickly show you what would that look like on a continuum. So you, you can see the emotional abuse, to property damage, to physical abuse, to sexual abuse, and the lethal abuse. So you see how it could be a continuum. But it doesn't go like that. I mean, it's not linear. It goes from one to the other. You know, depending on how the relationship is or where you are in that continuum. But it's certainly using some of this. It's just a quick drop to show you what it could look like. Understanding the victim. Very important that we keep in mind that we need to understand all the underlying of what this is all about. You know, certainly the loss of safety, trust, the feeling, the fears, the abandonment. Let's look at all of that. When we enter in relationships, huh? we don't want to enter in a relationship to see it fail. We enter in a relationship because we want to be in. We work hard at that relationship. Don't let anybody tell you that you don't work at relationship. Huh? Shoot. I work harder at relationship than I do anything because we're in relationship that rests for all our lives. Relationship with our children, relationship with our husband, relationship with our family. And each and every one of them is different. So they enter in a relationship. They enter in a relationship the same way they for us. Then I, so there's a lot of abandonment. There's a lot of, of despair. You know, and, and at the same time, you have a lot of hope. You hope. So that, you know, even the honeymoon, when you get the flowers, you hope. You hope that maybe, maybe it won't happen again. So you need to understand that. You also need to understand there's a lot of feeling of self-blame. What is wrong with me? And we help her a lot there, eh? Because we also tell her, what the hell is wrong with you? You're staying. So we have, you know, she has a lens, the same lens that we have. So we need to pay attention to that. The loss of positive self-image. You know that little light inside of our eyes? You know, when we smile, we sparkle. When that's gone, it's very difficult to gain again. And we need to understand it because it's hard to go through life with a self-esteem that's low, with a self-confidence that has been damaged. Also, a heightened feelings of helpless, helplessness, vulnerability, and powerlessness. Certainly, increased dependency on others. And it could so also be an increased feeling of rage, of anger. We have a hard time with women that are angry. Don't they have the right to be angry? And we need to understand that. I'm not saying to be violent, but we have a right to our anger. Everybody does. And the underlying reasons are certainly that loss of love and hope. Or certainly that guilt and shame that comes with being a victim. Certainly family and social pressure. You know, and I remember doing a presentation to uh, a lot of psycholo psychologists and social workers, and they were crisis interveners. And at the end, one of them came to me and she said, you know, I just realized during your talk that I'm a fantastic psychologist at work, but I'm a shitty friend. I have a friend who's been trying to tell me 
what she's been living, but I did not want to listen. So sometimes, because of where we are and what we do and all what we see, because we're never called to weddings. There were very, very few. We're called to pain. So that creates something which we'll talk to at the third webinar around how that changed our lens of the world and how we need to understand that. But certainly, when we are in families where this is happening, and we are social workers, sometimes we may not have the same lens with family as, or friends as we have with workers or clients. And certainly her dependency and fear. So some of the physical are certainly the injuries, the scars, the change of appetite, you know, stomach problems. You have respiratory problems, you can have fatigue, you can have ulcers, back pain, neck pain, many, many physical symptoms of what's happening inside of you. Our, you know, our body is our friend. It will tell us there's something wrong. But many of us have not heard, really learned how to listen to our body. Emotionally, there's still certain fears, sadness, shame, guilt, Stress, anxiety, low self-esteem, low self-confidence, loss of personal identity. Who made you you? And dependence, broken relationship with loved ones. Because many of them, remember when we talked about isolation? Well, you have to break your ties with your best friend or your mom because that is something that is very much into jealousy and not wanting you to have ties outside of him. Certainly depression and suicide. Now I'd like us to start thinking about all that I said through a trauma-informed lens. And why I talk about trauma-informed is because as soon as we start looking at trauma, because we live trauma, as soon as we have that lens, we may see things differently. Because the ongoing violence will bring on ongoing injury. And the likelihood of that injury becoming overwhelming over time is really part of their lives. And the one thing that we need to always know is that maybe the, the physical violence that they've lived or the emotional violence that they lived may be at the back of their mind, but there's triggers that are right there. You'll see people jump, and you don't understand why. Remember this one woman saying, I jump every time somebody slam a door. Do you know how many doors we slam in the daytime? Do you know how much her life must have been in hell? That was a trigger for her. So even though her violence was not in the forefront, that trigger certainly was. So we need to understand that. So the ongoing of that trauma is always with you. We need to also understand the barriers. The barriers faced. You know, the fear of injury or death. And we know that is the most vulnerable time is when you leave. So it is a fear, and it correctly, it's a righteous fear. They have also uh, the safety and the well-being of their children. They also desire to give that relationship a second chance. Remember that dependency piece that he has. He's very dependent on her. And so she really believes that she needs to be there. Or she may depend on the livelihood that they have together. If she has a farm with him. Who's going to feed the farm animals? You know, there's a lot of things that we need to understand. It's not as simple as leaving. And certainly a reduced sense of agency. The structural barriers. And some of them, you know, the lack of money, lack of housing, a lack of support services. Because there are support services doesn't mean that they're seen. We may know about them, but it doesn't mean that they know. So we need to think about that. And certainly the way that we give information. You know, just, I'll just take that one for you. In New Brunswick, there's a really big population that cannot read or write. Hmm? And I'm the worst of that. What do we do? We write everything down. We got our brochure, we got our pamphlets, you know, we write, write, write our reports, our fact sheets, we write. Unfortunately, we may not be reaching a very vulnerable population. So we need to understand that. 
And there's also some ineffective response that we need to look at. The family, friend, if you don't believe, if you're not there. The service providers, us, you know, if we don't understand all this, sometimes we can make more damage than good. And we need to know that. And we need to understand the cultural, the racial differences. We also need to understand that faith can have a big piece to play here. And we need to understand that the, there may be some lack of appropriate services, especially if we're looking at disability, if we're looking at older people, if we're looking at immigrants. We need to understand that. We also need to understand that timing is everything. You know, timing is everything. And it may happen in a five-minute span. And if we're not there in that five minutes, if we're not open, we may have lost that opportunity. So timing is everything. And it's certainly around that abundant episode and the remorse and the romance and then the in between where she's thinking, oh my God, there's something wrong here. There's something I gotta do. And it's in that peace that she may reach out. And we need to understand that because if we're not there, she'll feel betrayed. And then the anger that the society or us as service providers are really not there for her. So timely and supportive would certainly be around safety planning. It certainly is about looking if we can break that isolation that she feels. And it certainly be about getting some valuable information there. Eh? Now, we, we have to understand who defines success. Is it me or is it her? So if my success is she has to leave the relationship, then I may be running into some issues here. But if my success giving her all the help and the support and the information she needs so she can make a very clear decision. Then it's different. So we need to also be there. And she'll be, she, if we don't, then she's less tolerant. You know, she may knock at many doors. And the more doors she knocks, the less tolerant she may be of the services we have to offer. Because she's been damaged all through. And while figuring it out, there's a pile of places, right? The shelter, the outreach, the mental health or addiction services she may need. She may have a look at child protection. She may be with custody and access. She may have health care uh, system that she needs to go through. She also, private counseling she may need for herself or for her children. Family, neighbor, friends, community, you know, they may be very, very judgmental of what she's going through. And the criminal justice system, which is a very difficult system system to navigate for any one of us. So imagine if you're at your most vulnerable, trying to navigate that system. Now, recognize of looking at it. So instead of looking at some of these things that, they, that we see as harmful, or irresponsible. You know, she keeps going back, or you know, doesn't she think of which if we stop that and we start stop at looking at healthy versus unhealthy or looking at wellness versus disorder. But we only look at honoring the person on their path. Honoring their knowledge of what they're living. Because if we start from there, we're starting from with them. We're starting with their knowledge so that we are really their skills. They're bringing their skills to the entire intervention because they have a lot of skills. And sometimes we forget all the skills that they have. And especially, you know, we get some examples that some of the healthy versus unhealthy that we may think, you know, alcohol abuse is certainly one of them. But if the alcohol abuse is keeping you alive, You may need to work on how to help and support her, not try to take away then a crutch, but a crutch that's actually helping her at this moment. So we need to look at things differently. And we certainly need to understand their knowledge of their reality. Lives are more understandable that way. It's more understandable of what, why they're living what they're living. And we also, the, the person in front of will be, will feel validated. 
will fear listened to. And their behaviors developed to cope may be seen as pathological if you don't do it that way. You know, if you're looking at me as what's wrong with me, or if you're looking at me as Rena the person, that has a problem. Look at the difference. If you forget Rena, the only thing you see is a problem, then there's something really hurt, hurtful in this. And I may not be listening. I may really isolate myself. It's a skill, a skill I have. I have many skills. I have different skills that I have really took on to be able to live the life that I'm leading. Eh? So we need to understand that. And we need to understand that those are coping mechanisms. They're not doing it to hurt us. They're not doing it at all at us. They're doing it to cope. And so some of the things here we need to understand also that they are powerful in their own lives. And we need to give them back those powers. And certainly we need to be able to look at language that we use. I do love the term empowerment. But there's an issue with empowerment if you're using it to do it to them and not with them. And so we need to really understand that. We cannot become their crutch. And so that is certainly it's about empowering, about getting back their power. So it is about working together, always working together, so that they cannot become their problem. They always stay the person. And that is really difficult, but very important. And then we look at poor choice differently. Eh? And so, and we don't think about, oh, I would have known better. You know, I wouldn't have gone back. We'll look at it through their eyes, looking at the paths that they're on. And so we support their self-determination. We support their skills and all that they've learned. And so we become with them. We walk side by side, so we don't have to know it all. You know, because we have a tendency sometimes as a professional of thinking, I've, I've got to know it all. But it's not about that. Certainly not knowing it all. I can't know somebody else's lives. But I can walk beside them, though. They can teach me. They can teach me. And that, and it's in that teaching that I learn. And I'll be better open for the next person that I will meet. So it's certainly about that. It's about remembering that we all have power. We have a lot of power. And there has been a lot of power inequalities in their lives. And they understand that. They have been a lot of skills, a lot of skills at conforming. They know already what we want to do, they'll conform to that. So we need to change that, to give them back that, that support, that power over their own lives. So when we work collaboratively, well, it begins with us. That means we have to do our work. We need to understand who we are, what we've gone through. We need to understand that how our beliefs, our assumptions, the myths, all of that is also part of us. And if we haven't done that work, they'll know. They're the greatest observer in the world. That has kept them alive. So we need to do a lot of that work. It's very important. We need to prepare ourselves. And if I had longer, I would really go in depth because I really believe in this. Because we can. And you know why? Because we ask them in five minutes. They give us their, their secret, their entire lives. And to trust us. Just like that. Just because. I'm really a social worker. And we need to understand that that is very difficult. But if we shift that and we build that trust, then it is a different story. And if we build together on our strength, that relationship will open those doors in a different way. And we'll actually look at our own structures, not only at how I intervene, but I'll be able to then look at how the structures around me are either hindering or helping. You know, it's much, much more. 
had that one person in front of you. It's all those structures that are there that are also very much part of her life. So we need to understand that. And finally, then I am at my last one. Finally, we need to increase our cultural competency. You know, increase that cultural is really regarding, regarding all the intersecting, the age, the sex, the gender diversity, the gender relationship, the class, the ethnicity, the ability, the ra racialization, and the location, urban versus uh, uh, rural. We need to keep that in mind. But we need to keep that in mind with an attention, and a critical attention, at our own position. Me, Rena, that works, makes a good salary, are very different than somebody else that will may come and see me. So we need to understand that. You know, already there's an equality of power. And I need to balance that somehow. And we need to know that we can build that. That's a one good thing. We can always build from our learning. So if we can keep on learning, never shut our ear, but learn from everything that everyone can teach us. Then we're more open for the next one. Thank you. Thank you, Rina, uh, for sharing your knowledge and experience uh, on violence in the lives of women. Uh, so it's time for now uh, for us to move on to question and answer, a portion of this presentation. Um, and I would like maybe to ask at the floor if, uh, if you have a question uh, for Rina. We're playing the game of the microphone. <laughs> Any question? Yes. Hi, Rena. Um, I just wanted to check with you around the discussion you had around power um, within the community and with, as well as with the workers who respond to these situations. And as a frontline worker, I'm aware of stories from women in the community who have had um, basically a lack of response, a blind eye turned to their situation by um, people in power, sometimes in the police services, in very small communities, and so the people they seek help from have not been available to support them or intervene. Could you speak a bit about that, please? Certainly. Thank you, Janet. That's a very good question. It's, a, it's very difficult, I mean, because we are one of many of the service providers out there. We are one. Social workers are certainly one, but police officers are another. Certainly, the justice system is a, it's a very a black and white system that... that uh, creates a lot of, of uh, for lack of a better word, as some, some difficulties uh, with uh, dealing with issues of IPD. Uh, one of the things around that power and control, a lot of times, if you haven't received some of the training around the complexities, understanding, sitting with yourself, and being, as social workers, we have to do that. We have to face the mirror and face us. You know, we have understood that from our studies. We have, but that is not part of everybody's background. And we need to understand that we need to always be prepared as social worker to remind others of that importance of the power we have, the power of our response over somebody that has very little power. And so we'll keep the little power she has, which may be not being a witness, which may be not talking, because that's the only thing. She doesn't know where her story is going to go. And if she doesn't trust the system, her story may stay with her. And so you have a lot of people that will never call. They will never even reach out to the system. I mean, we have a population that we know comes to services. But there's a big population out there that doesn't. And some of it also could be people like us. Now let's turn that, flip that around. And let's imagine as social workers you are living a situation of violence at home. Where would you go? 
who would you talk to? What about that power that the system now has over you? We need to understand that we are. We can shift those shoes, eh? And understand, as police officers, same thing. What happened if there are victims? Who did they talk to? Who did they turn to? Because your profession is now attached to your professional life and to your personal life. So we need to also remember that. And it is, I mean, the power and control is out there, but we need to always talk about it. Constantly remind ourselves of it on a daily basis, actually. You know, we should never see anyone, friends, anyone, without, first of all, look outside ourselves, because we're all, every day is different. Someday we're more vulnerable than others. And if we're not ready, well, they are. So we need to always be ready and understanding that and being honest with ourselves. Other questions? Uh, thank you, Rena. <laughs> Um, you had said earlier about the skills that women have that are dealing with uh, in intimate partner violence, and I'm just wondering, with your experience, if you could uh, tell us some, yeah, just what some of those skills are that, that they do have. That, 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 you know. I guess one of the biggest skills that she, that the person has, is the power of observation, because it kept her alive. She also has skills of understanding her issue, of knowing, and the skill of also being able to read him. And that's the, the, the big, big fear, because she may be able to read, or the person may be able to read the other for a long time, but then all of a sudden something shifts. And they may not understand they can't read this anymore. And that's when it goes from maybe medium risk to higher risk. And we need to understand that, the, the low, medium, and high risk. And we need to be able to, be, to understand the complexities of those risks and the complexities of doing that, that, that safety plan with her. Because if it is her safety plan, not mine, I will understand all the tools that she has. And so she'll tell me, no, no, I understand, you know. Okay, so I have, I have, in my mind, I know. This way, I always talk to my friend. I have my password and passport and all that. They're already there. We know then that she has a really good understanding of what she's living. And she may be also being able to tell you other stuff that may not have come out if we don't talk about that. She may not tell you that she's had suicidal ideation because it's getting really bad at home. Or she may not tell you that she sees that she's now really not able to come out anymore because she feels desperate. You know, she may not tell you a lot of things if we have not talked about those power, those skills that they have in their own lives and the things that they do to protect themselves and their children are amazing. Some of the things that they do are just unbelievable. And we need to recognize that. And instead of saying, oh my God, you're doing that with your children, to say, wow, you thought of that, and together work on something so that they are part of that plan on a constant basis. So it's not something that we drop on their lap, but it's something that we do together. So that is some of their strength. They are certainly part of the game if we let them. Is there any question on the... Yes? Okay. The, uh, the uh, author is Ellen Pence. E-L-L-E-N. Pence is spelled P-E-N-S-E. -E. And if you just go on YouTube and write her name, the power and control will come, and you'll see the YouTube on a, of her. 
uh, how would you suggest we, as social worker, working in multidisciplinary setting with professionals who have training that differs from our address, the difference in training to ensure that, <coughs> sorry, to ensure that that we are utilizing the tools and principles you discussed today. Well, you start by talking about it. You know, one thing that I have learned, the more and more I talk about the way that I view and, my, and I talk about that trauma-informed lens and about how we can shift that power that we have and that we can really get help somebody that I talk to them about with police officers, when I talk to, I mean, clergy, when I talk to cosmetologists, when I talk about this issue, I always refer to the power we have. I always refer to the skills the person has. I always refer to what I've done today. So, you know, it, it won't come easily because that this is not only about talking, it needs about changing some of the way we do business. Some of the way that even maybe our supervisors wants us to do business. And it's not easy. But if we never go there, nothing will ever change. And so we need to find your allies. Talk to your allies. Talk to the champions you'll have. And with them, you can start doing small things, inviting somebody to come and present. So it's not you, but it's somebody else coming talking the same language as you. you now use the skills you have around to try to make sure that everybody at your workplace have the skills or at least the information and understand the way that you are using those skills. So it's all about making sure that the information is out there. It's difficult, not easy, but it needs to be done because we know that the way we're doing it is not doing it. So we need to shift that. We really need to shift, not only for our clients and for the, the women we encounter, but for ourselves. For ourselves. Because think of it. Think of the shift on your shoulders when you think you're not carrying the, wor the world, but you're sharing that world. That shift is unbelievable. I'll take one from Jayla. I appreciate your point about learning from the people we work with because it's certainly been the biggest learning. But what also has to happen in ourselves is suspension of judgment, mm -hmm. examining our own assumptions. We all have them, whether we recognize them or not. Because being open, as you describe, and, and the people I've worked with, are, they're hypervigilant. They're missing nothing. And they miss, they don't, they don't miss people being judgmental, whether they think they're being judgmental or not. Very good point, yeah. I mean, that is the one thing I always say. We all come from the same society. We all have myths. We all have attitudes. Believe it or not, we all do. I mean, hey, before I start talking about different things, I had my own way. I had my, my, my parents' way of looking at the world until I decided to look at it with my own eyes. And it's not easy. That means that we really face some really hard questions, you know, about a lot of different issues that we have to deal with. You know, what do I really think about abortion? What do I really think about uh, uh, people from another race? What do I really think about older people being at, at the hospital all the time? What do I really think about people that are on the street? And when I sit with all these, and these are just minor, they've come popped to my head right now, but some are really, really deep inside of us. You know, some are really deep, and some comes from our own family living. A lot of us have not chosen social worker, social work for no reason. You know, I've met many social workers that have chosen social work because they want to fix their family. Huh? So we need to know that. So that means you need to look at yourself. Eh? So we need to do that work. Because, as Dela said, it is true. If you have not, they will know. And you will lose that. That five minutes 
You know, they may be with you for an hour, but you may have lost them the first five minutes. That's all the time we have. Ah. Oh. Thank you, Rena. So this concludes the question period of this presentation. Uh, so if you would like to receive more information, uh, please don't hesitate to contact Rena. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, e each and every one of you for joining us today and contributing to the success of this, the first webinar in a series of three uh, focusing on intimate partner violence. Uh, also, just to for me information, a link to, to this presentation will be uploaded on the Canadian Association of Social Workers website as well as the New Brunswick Association of Social Workers website. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Rena uh, for, for your time uh, with your, all of your knowledge uh, for lending uh, for today and also to share your experience. Um, and I thank you again uh, for uh, joining us today and we look forward to be with you at the next webinar. Thank you very much, which will be February 25th. Thank you very much. <laughs>